Hi everybody, this is a Mars Hill Latin 2 lecture for lessons 21, 20, or sorry, 21, unit uh, 4 review and 22. Okay, so 21 is an interesting lesson. You get, we start talking about questions and how to make certain kinds of questions. Um, and there are several kinds of questions. Um, one that we're going to learn today is questions, like direct questions. Um, and those are introduced by question words. Uh, so question words can be interrogative adverbs, adjectives, or pronouns. For example, who, what, when, where, and why, and how. So these questions require an answer other than yes or no. So this is a different kind of question than a yes or no question. All right. So here you have a list of nine vocab words um, and the first eight of them are regular question words so we have quiz which means who we have quid which means what uh, we have quando which is when ubi is where or in what place cur is why quote is how many quam do is for how long and quamodo is how or in what manner. Okay, and then we have the last one is uh, what we call an enclitic, and we'll come back to that one when we talk about yes or no questions. Okay, so let's look at these question words and examples. So here are some questions at the bottom of page 62. We have quid novi, that means what's new? Uh, quid being the subject, what, and uh, novi being a predicate adjective, what is new? Here's another one, quid est tibi nomen. So that's what is your name, or more literally, what is the name tibi to you? Okay, uh, then we have quomodo vales. That's uh, how are you? How do you fare? And uh, a note about that is Latin also has quid agis to mean the same thing. Quid agis or quid vales, I'm sorry, comodo vales are similar sentences. Okay, um, and on the other side of this table you see um, answers you could give. So maybe we'll practice some of that in class um, that you have it to look at until then. Okay, so that's one kind of question. Question, questions uh, introduced by interrogative words. Now, the other kind of question we want to talk about today, and this is not the, these two are not the only kinds of questions, but we won't get to the others till uh, Latin 4, I think. So, um, on page 63, yes or no questions are introduced by the enclitic ne, which is added to the end of the first word of the sentence, which is usually the verb. Okay, so um, before we explain that a little bit more, an enclitic, which is spelled E-N-C-L-I-T-I-C, -I -I an enclitic is a word or a suffix that attaches itself to the end of another word uh, to do a certain thing, uh, to add a certain meaning. Another one you may have come across is que, um, Q-U-E, that means and, and you just sort of attach it to the end of a word, um, and that's how it exists. So the one we do, the one we add for a yes or no question is ne. So here's an example. We have orabat means he was praying, but if we add a ne to the end, orabat ne, we change the sentence to say, was he praying? Okay. In English, we make yes or no questions by placing a helping verb first. So in English, we would have he was praying. And then to make it a question, we switch the word order. We say, was he praying? But in Latin, we're adding just the, the enclitic. Similarly, we have labora bunt. In Latin means um, they will work. And in English, to make it a uh, question, we say, will they work, instead of they will work. But in Latin, we say, laborabunt ne. 
Okay, so there are two tenses which may be used, which may be translated without helping verbs, the present and the perfect. Both, but both of these tenses have two other options with helping verbs. To translate questions in the present or the perfect tense, choose a helping verb and place it first. So for example, for clamat, we would say he shouts, he is shouting, or he does shout. Um, to say ne, we would say is he shouting or does he shout. So there's two ways to translate um, our question version, which is does he shout or is he shouting? Similarly, in the perfect, klamavit is he shouted, he did shout, or he has shouted. That's how we do our perfects. But uh, in the question form, klamavit ne, we can translate that, did he shout, or has he shouted? Okay, so that's an introduction to questions. The main thing to remember is the uh, two kinds we studied, the first kind being questions introduced, direct questions introduced by a question word, and the other kind, the yes or no question, okay? And that's signified by the enclitic ne. Okay, in the unit four review, uh, you are reviewing the third conjugation, fourth conjugation, and third IO conjugations in the perfect system. Remember that we have the present system verbs and the perfect system verbs, where present verbs are present, imperfect, and future. And past or perfect system verbs are perfect, pluperfect, and future perfect. And those are the ones you studied this week for the third, fourth, and third IO conjugations. So I will just remind you how to form those words form those uh, tenses, and after that we'll move on to lesson 20, uh, 22, I guess. Yeah, 22. So remember, when you're going to form a present system verb, you are going to use your present uh, stem. And you find the present stem by going to the second principal part and cutting off your RE. But to form a perfect system word, you need to go to the perfect stem, which is the third principal part without its ending. You cut off the I. So for example, for Alma, or let's take a third conjugation. So the example of Rego, we go to the third principal part, Rexy, and we cut off our I, so we get Rex. And then for the perfect uh, tense, you just add your perfect ending. So Rexy, Rexisti, Rexit, etc. Okay. Then for a perfect, or sorry, pluperfect, you take your same stem, your third principal part minus the I, and you're gonna add uh, the imperfect of sum. So you get rexarom, rexaros, rexarot, etc. Okay, um, the future perfect is the same except you're going to add the imp I'm sorry, the future of sum rather than adding the imperfect of sum. So you get rexaro, rexaris, rexarit. Rexerimus, Rexeritis, uh, I'm sorry, Rexa, yeah, Rexeritis, and then the third person plural is Rexerint, not Rexerunt, and as you know, the reason for that is that the third person plural future perfect can't match the third person plural perfect, which is also Rexerunt, so we change it to an I instead of the U. All right, all of that should be familiar to you. Um, and then you have your vocab. You have maybe 25 uh, verbs there to memorize. Make sure you know your principal parts, especially for the third conjugation because they are irregular. And do you want to make sure that you don't accidentally choose the wrong stem to work with when you're conjugating? I know we went through in class uh, the example of do, uh, which has the strange Principal, third principal part, deddy, and how that trips people up when they're trying to conjugate perfect system tenses. So make sure that's not you. Okay, so uh, we're moving on to a new unit uh, about verbs, and we're learning about the passive. We've been talking about the active for a long time, and we're just now introducing the passive. 
So I'm gonna read a little bit about uh, unit five and then we'll talk about lesson 22. So the six attributes of Latin verbs are conjugation, person, number, tense, mood, and voice. In this unit, we're gonna talk about voice. So Latin and English verbs have two voices, the active and the passive. All the verb conjugations you have learned thus far have been in the active, so you've only learned about the active. In the active voice, the subject performs the action of the verb. But in the passive voice, the subject receives the action of the verb. Here are two sentences that illustrate the active and the passive voice. So here's an active sentence. Caesar conquered the Gauls. So in that sentence, the verb is conquered. And what we want to ask ourselves is, who is doing the action? Well, the subject is doing the action. Caesar conquered. Caesar's the one that did it. Um, and here, consider this passive voice uh, sentence. So, the Gauls were conquered by Caesar. Now, we notice that Ga the Gauls here are the subject of the sentence, since they're what the sentence is about. But in this case, they aren't doing the conquering, but they are being conquered. So, let me read that one more time. The Gauls were conquered by Caesar. So that's a case where the subject is receiving the action of the verb rather than performing the action of the verb. The passive voice of the present system is formed by substituting the passive personal endings for the active personal endings. So remember that the active personal endings are O or M and then S, T, MUS, TIS, NT. Similarly, the passive personal endings are or or er, then ris, tour, more, many, n, tor. Those are the passive personal endings. So I want you to, for both the active and the passive personal endings, make sure you really rehearse those and you know those by heart. So once more, the passive personal endings are or 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 er, and then ris, tour, more, many, n, tor. Okay? All right, so lesson 22. That was sort of an overview of the whole unit, and now we're going to dive into lesson 22 specifically. So in this lesson, you're learning the first conjugation, present tense, passive voice. So just the present tense. And the way that goes is your uh, stem, om, plus your endings, uh, your passive personal ending. So we have am um, or, am um, aris, am um, autor, am um, amor, am um, amini, am um, mantor. So those are the endings. Now remember the in the passive the subject doesn't perform the action but receives it. So to form the one more time the, to form the passive of the present tense you just substitute the passive personal endings where we had the active personal endings before. Okay, um, then we have one, about 10 vocab in the second declension masculine that are added this week, so make sure you know those. Um, and then on page 69, uh, we have our active and passive personal endings listed. You'll see those in your lesson. Um, Here's a instruction. Write out the conjugation of amo in the present tense. Then go back out and rewrite it, substituting the passive personal endings for the active personal endings. So that's a good practice. The subject is always the focus of a sentence. The sentence below is in the active voice and the focus is on the action of Caesar. So Caesar conquered the Gauls. The same information can be written in the passive voice. You can say the Gauls were conquered by Caesar. You notice that that's essentially the same sentence, but one is made passive and one is active. Okay, one more grammar concept and then we're done for this lecture. So, there's something called the ablative of agent. Okay, so the in the passive voice, the actual person or living agent 
who performs the action of the verb may be expressed by the prepositional phrase um, with a or ab plus uh, the object in the ablative case. So um, for example, we can say the Gauls were conquered by Caesar. The way we would translate that is Gali, that's the subject, the Gauls, uh, superantor, so there we have our passive, they were conquered. And then we say a caesare, that means by Caesar. Or we can say Gali superantor, the Gauls were conquered, ab hostibus, and that means by the enemies. Now the difference between a and ab is like the difference in English between a and an. So I would say an apple, but I would say a banana. What's the difference there? The reason I change the a to the an is dependent on whether the next word starts with a consonant or a vowel. If the word following it starts with a vowel, then I include the n in English. Notice that again, an apple. See, the an had the consonant at the end, it has the n, but the apple starts with a vowel. So we don't want two vowels to touch, and we don't want two consonants to touch. We want them to be opposites. So we don't say a uh, apple, we say an apple, and we don't say an banana, we say a uh, banana. In Latin, it's the same thing. If we have ab, uh, if we have caesare following it, you see that C, so we know we don't want a consonant at the a end of the A. Uh. So we say A uh, Kaiser. Similarly, um, when we have hostibus following, the H there, ha, is it counts as a um, it counts as a vowel for this situation. So we have ab uh, hostibus. Okay, I hope most of that was helpful. And I will see you in class. God bless you.